Can you can you read the small print? Yeah. Let me just start to share a couple of stories, and I, I, I want to um, begin by giving examples. Two two examples, two extremes that I've um, seen. I was I was there for um, one right on this end is someone who will elevate the church in the most extraordinary way. Now, we know that from Scripture, the church is always the people. But I'm thinking of a situation where a group of pastors, and I was in this group, uh, were being shown over a historical building. And uh, uh, now, I don't like calling it a church building, but you understand, I've got to use that term so people know. And, um, and it was quite interesting, because even though it was not uh, in the Catholic tradition, the... Uh, the uh, minister, I'll call him that, uh, had, a, had a lot of Catholic terminology. He insisted on being called a priest, even though within his denomination that, that wasn't a normal term. He insisted we all call him father. And I, I looked at him, I thought, you're not my dad. <laughs> but, but when we looked through the, through the building, it immediately struck me how the building had been structured like the Old Testament temple. <coughs> in that there was a section where the people were. Then there was like this, um, uh, like a fence sort of thing inside uh, with a gate. And the, the next section was like the holy place. And uh, I noticed that when we all came in, and uh, without thinking, someone just opened the gate and we all trudged into the holy place, I noticed that this minister's body language became very defensive and he became very ill at ease. He was not comfortable with this because this was his domain. He was the priest. This was his house. And then when the leader of the group, the um, uh, minister's fellowship president, without realizing, opened the next little gate and walked into the Holy of Holies, that little section right at the end, uh, the, um, the uh, the, the minister there could not handle that and actually physically brought him out of there and shut the gate. <laughs> and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, my, my, my. All right, so that's one extreme of people who, who elevate the church. And, and in this case, actually elevate the building and elevate the, the uh, outward aspects of it. Now, up the other end, and I'm thinking, and, and some of you were probably in this meeting or the, the meetings, we, years and years and years ago, yeah, we had a, um, a couple of guys who were uh, very, I mean, from their own perspective, very Jesus-oriented. And um, they had enormous trouble with the thought of being part of a local church. That, that created enormous difficulty for me. And there were, there were three of these guys who uh, came in to some of, the, some of the meetings and they sat together and they read the Bible all the way through the meeting. So when we uh, sang and we stood, they just all sat there reading the Bible. When we greeted each other, they all sat there reading the Bible. When I preached, they just sat there reading the Bible. <laughs> and when I talked with them, uh, it, was like, it was like they were so emphatic that they were caught up with Jesus, but clearly they had an inward problem. I remember many, many, many years back talking with a pastor from Sydney who was oversighting a church down at Cooma in that area. And he described a couple of guys and he said, do you know what they do? They come into the meeting and they sit there and they just read the Bible. And he went through it and I said, can I give you some names and you tell me? And I went through it. He said, how did you know their names? I said, well, well, well. And it was years and years later and they hadn't changed. All right, so, so here are two extremes. Up one end, people who elevate the church so much. Up, up another end, people who elevate Jesus. And, and can I say, I'm uh, just talking with the minister who was showing us around the uh, uh, building. He had enormous troubles with the term born again. He had great difficulty with that term too. And, and uh, it just did honestly make us wonder whether he had experience uh, personally. 
the new birth, but that was probably just something more in uh, my own heart than, than other people's hearts. So let me just start with a scripture that I have um, talked about in, in recent times, and I just want to emphasize to you, it's in Daniel chapter 7, and verses 13 and 14, and if you know the book of Daniel, and you know chapter 7, there's a series of uh, four, um, uh, four aspects to a vision that um, Daniel has, and, and there are four beasts, and they represent four kingdoms. And in the midst of the fourth kingdom, something amazing happens. And I'm reading from verses 13 and 14. And verse 13 says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Now we know the Lord Jesus chose more than any other term for himself, the term, the son of man. And he chose this term... Uh, it seemingly so that those who had ears to hear would relate it back to this particular scripture. So, uh, one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days, another term for the Father, was led into his presence. Then it said he was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So when Jesus was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, he entered in on the clouds of glory into the Father's presence and he was crowned king of God's kingdom. So God's kingdom from that moment on was where this Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, where He reigned. Now when I say where, I don't mean a geographical place. You can't pray, God, establish your kingdom in my street. And Well, you can pray that, but how God understands that is that He establishes His kingdom in human hearts. It's not over a certain block of land, so. It is His kingdom is established, His reign, His rule is in human hearts. So when, we, when we, we pray for His kingdom to come, we're, we're praying that His reign and His rule be extended. Alright, so where Christ's reign is yielded to, there His kingdom is extended. And our understanding is that Daniel 7, 13 and 14 occurred uh, as the Lord Jesus, having gone to the cross, having gone into the grave, having been raised from the dead, and then ascended to the Father, was then invested as the king over God's kingdom. So from then, that time on, when we read the scripture about the kingdom of God, we understand from that time, Christ is the king who is ruling over God's kingdom. Are you still with me? Yes. Good after five minutes. I still have you. That's good. Now, if you would come with me to John chapter 3 and verse 3. Uh, a scripture that a couple of weeks back Tony Llewellyn touched on and he was sharing and what a great message that was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, John 3 verse 3. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. So what Jesus is saying is until we're born again, until we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God has come and indwells us and there's a new birth, a new spiritual life that is birthed in us in that moment of faith, and, and until that time, trying to fathom the kingdom of God, trying to fathom Christ's rulership is extremely difficult. It's, it, it's unfathomable. It's something that you can never explain to someone who has not been born again. And so they'll have some kind of understanding. So Jesus could actually say, until you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom. Like the kingdom is just a, almost like a foreign, foreign understanding to you. And then just um, uh, two verses down, chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. So if I come back, and I, I personally take being born of water and the Spirit, uh, the, the new birth, uh, and so when someone puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they, they trust Him, they are ushered in, they are brought in to the reign and the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. So until we're born again, we're not under, under Christ's reign or Christ's rule. 
But then when we are born again, we're, we're brought into that amazing place where we, we see for the first time that Christ is truly Lord and we yield to that kingship. Um, so as we're born again, we enter Christ's kingdom, we live under that kingdom, under that king, and we learn to be governed by it. Um, I preached on the, the Lord's Prayer a couple of weeks back, and, and uh, you'll all remember that, won't you? Yes. yes. Three of you, thank you, that's really good. <laughs> Two more than I expected. So, but there's part of that prayer where we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. And then in that message, I went through the next three areas where the Lord Jesus is saying, if you pray this way, you're inviting me to govern more of your life in three distinct areas. And I made those areas in that particular message. And I actually titled that message, the Lord's Prayer, an invitation for divine invasion. Because when we pray that, we are inviting Christ to invade us and to, and to take more than he had previously. I use the uh, parallel of June 6, 1944, D-Day. That um, day when the Allied forces, uh, uh, 25,000 men stormed the beaches of Normandy down six beaches. And, and, for, and that, in a sense, was the beginning of the end of the Axis powers. The uh, powers under, under Germany, Italy had already surrendered. So, so that became that divine invasion was a taking back. Of, of land that previously had been had been freely owned by those nations, but they had lost it, uh, and they lost it to the to the uh, German power. So as we grow in Christ, He takes more and more land from the enemy, and He makes it His. So when I'm I'm praying, Thy kingdom come, I am inviting God. I'm saying. Let there be another D-Day in me. Uh, come into this area of my life. Perhaps God exposes some area of my life, something that, that I didn't see as clearly before, and He exposes it through a trial, and I, I see something in my heart that, that isn't really good, and then if, if I have the wisdom, I come to Him, and I say, God, you've exposed this to me. I'm asking you now to work on this area in my life. And that's what he's wanting. So I'm saying, I want to come under your government, under your leadership, under your rule. I want you to establish your kingdom in that particular area of my life. So it is likened to an invasion. Now, let me now come. I want to just give you two, uh, two large principles that relate the kingdom of God and the church and, and see how they relate together. The first one, and the obvious one, is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, creates the church. It creates the church. How does it do that? I trust you can read that right it clearly. As I place my faith in Christ, I'm born again, and I enter Christ's kingdom, and I, I come under His rulership. But entering His kingdom also means I'm adopted into God's family, as, uh, as his child, so I'm added to his family on earth, which is the church. So, so it, you, you can't have one without the other. So as I, as I come into his kingdom, I am added to his church. That's the way that God does these two great works together. So um, uh, physically joining other believers to, to worship, to fellowship, to be discipled, to grow, is the, the outward sign of what God has already done in us spiritually. So coming along, being part of a local church, is just outwardly expressing what God has already done in our heart. He's already added us to the church, to the community of believers, and so the outward expression is that we gather together. Give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> You're here. So, so when I look at scriptures like in uh, Acts chapter 2, and I'm uh, reading uh, verse 41, uh, this is uh, a Peter's uh, Pentecost Day sermon, uh, and then the, 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 the commentary from Luke, he said, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, 3,000 were added to what? 3,000 were added to the kingdom of God, and 3,000 were added to the church. The same 3,000. 
the same 3,000. I find it interesting that then, that then Luke goes in, the book of Acts describes the, 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 the community life of this, this early body uh, from verse 42 down to uh, really the very end, verse 47. But then I just want to come into verse 47 and it says, Praising God, enjoying favour of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So, so Luke just talks about them being added. And so Luke's understanding is they're being added to the kingdom of God and they're being added to the church because the two go together. You can't have one without the other. Please don't want to burst into song on that. I don't want to hear that. All right. So our second big principle is this. The church is the instrument of God's kingdom, of Christ's kingdom. Now, I, I tried to find some other word than, than instrument. I, I looked at words like vehicle. I looked at all kinds of words, but I came back to this word. So, the, so what I'm saying here, the church is the, the instrument, is, is what God uses here on earth to extend his, his kingdom. Let me just read to you, just um, uh, we know that when Jesus worked in with his disciples, he sent out, he sent out the twelve, then he, he, after that he sent out seventy-two. And I'm just reading the, um, the first one uh, from Luke chapter 9. And it says this, it said that when Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, to cure all diseases, and he sent them out to preach what? The kingdom, kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Alright, so, so he sends them out with a clear message. And what's their message? Kingdom. The kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. See, their, their message is that there is a God who is ruling and reigning. And he wants to rule and reign in human hearts. So that's the message that the early disciples shared. And when you look through the number of times, that, uh, and uh, uh, if you've got a really holy Bible, and look at your Bible that says holy Bible, then, then get one that's not quite as holy, that you can underline, because then if you begin to underline, every time you see the reference kingdom of God, or in Matthew's Gospel, kingdom of heaven, Matthew wrote mainly to, uh, to uh, Jews who would not feel comfortable reading God's name over and over and over. So he changed kingdom of God to kingdom of heaven. And so if you underline it, you'll be amazed that Jesus' principal preaching topic was the kingdom of God. He wanted people to know that there was a God who ruled, who reigned. And he wanted them to come under the, the uh, government of, of, of that kingdom, the government and the rule of that God. And then after he was raised from the dead, the heavenly father invested him at, or, or coronated him, the coronation. He was declared to be the king of this kingdom. And, and will be, we read in 1 Corinthians 15, until he returns, in which case he then hands the kingdom back to the heavenly Father. All right, so, so the church is God's instrument. The church is God's instrument. Now, what, do you think Jesus would have done better sending out angels? Uh, he sent out people, human beings. Put up your hand if you're a human being. All right, put up your hand if you're an angel. <laughs> I'm the wife's to be any one of the other people. <laughs> right. He didn't send out angels, he sent out disciples. They preached the message of God's kingdom, his rule, his reign, and hear this, they demonstrated his rule and reign by setting people free from demons and diseases. See, the, the, the setting them free from demons and diseases was related to the kingdom of God. I, I've been going through my own personal uh, search, trying to just work out where, like healing in the atonement, and then, well, these disciples, the healing authority they had, had nothing to do with healing in the atonement because Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. And, and so I, I see a, a clear pathway that when they preach the kingdom and the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ, then uh, under that kingdom there was no room for demons and darkness and, and even in this case there was no room for disease. That's a bit scary, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's not scary, it's quite exciting. But it's scary when you think of the implications of that. Alright, so, so what I want to, to do now is begin to um, uh, look at 
How is the church the instrument of God's kingdom? And I want to just give you four ways that I see the, the church as the instrument of, 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 of God's kingdom. And number one, the church is God's instrument to proclaim the message of Christ's kingdom. The message of Christ's kingdom. So when I look at the uh, scriptures and I look, say, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the um, book of Acts because I'm seeing there, the, seeing the, the, the message, seeing what they said, because there are, uh, in some places, there's a, a good des description of what was said, but I'm particularly interested in some of the summary passages that describe the preaching. And I'm looking at one in Acts chapter 8. And uh, in Acts chapter 8, I'm reading in verse 4, it said, Those who have been scattered preach the word wherever they went. Alright, so this stage I've just got they preached the word. Uh, verse 5, Philip went down to a city in Samaria, proclaimed Christ there. So, alright, he proclaimed Christ. So, I've got a bit more of a description of what he, what he actually preached. Then I come over to verse 12. And it's a summary scripture, and it said, But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So I'm, I'm suddenly seeing that, that the message that was preached, and, and it was not what we would call an ordinary evangelistic message, in that it had a slant on it that talked about the rulership and the reign of God. Now, I don't mean that it didn't have the content of an evangelistic message, because without that content, there could not have been people come to Christ. But I'm saying there was a slam. There was an emphasis that God has a kingdom. And if you respond to the gospel, you come into that kingdom, and you come under the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't want to come under the rulership of Jesus Christ, there is no halfway point. You can't say, it's all right, I'll just, just pray a prayer and then later you'll, you'll kind of think about it. And, and it's like saying, now wait a minute, I want you to understand, when you respond, you are coming under Christ's rulership and under Christ's government. And, and for a lot of people, that can be very scary. And then I, I, I work my way through Acts, but I realise the time. I don't want to go through too much now, but I'll just pick up one more. Acts chapter 19 and verse 8. Um, where it's talking about Paul's ministry. Paul entered the, the synagogue, spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom, kingdom of God. God. So his principal preaching topic was the rule and the reign of God. And that rule and that reign had been invested in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the king from the time of his ascension up until the time of his return. So the first thing I see here is that the church... Uh, as part of the, the instrument, the, the church is God's instrument to proclaim the message of Christ's kingdom. Now this handsome fellow is... Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. Well done. Uh, the Mongol conqueror founded the largest land empire in history. Now he sent a request to the Pope via Marco Polo for 100 teachers able to show that the way of Christ was superior to come and to teach Christianity. After two years, Rome sent two men who demanded that Genius can Khan come under Rome's power. And so Khan rejected this and he turned his empire over to Islam. He went another way. See, because what he wanted, he wanted the message in a sense of the kingdom, but what he got were people who preached the message of the church. Not as the instrument of the kingdom, but in place of the kingdom. Genghis Khan wanted to know the way of Christ was superior, but that's not what he heard back. So the church's basic message is to be Christ and his kingdom. It's his rule and his reign. So the, the first part when I'm talking about the church being the instrument of the kingdom, the first thing I'm saying is that the church is God's instrument to proclaim the message of Christ's kingdom. The, 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 the common thread in all preaching, in all Christian churches, should be the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the rule of Christ, the, the rule and the reign. Christ and his kingdom uh, should be that, that common thread through all preaching. Uh, and I don't mean you don't preach on it. One doesn't ever talk about anything else. I'm just saying it has to be the common thread. Now, the second aspect of this, talking about the, uh, the church as the, the instrument of the, of the kingdom, uh, uh, is this. The church is God's instrument. We said, first of all, uh, it was to proclaim the message of Christ's kingdom. Secondly, uh, it is to display the wisdom of Christ's kingdom. The wisdom. And I'd like to I'll just read to you from Ephesians chapter 1, or chapter 3. I'll try to make it a tiny bit briefer. Chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 8. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 8. It said, for it is... Whoop! Does that sound right? Chapter, got the wrong chapter. Chapter 3 and verse 8. And Paul says this, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's what he preached. The unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past has been kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. And then he's saying, this is according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I've heard all kinds of people talk about what that talks about. I've heard everything from spiritual warfare through to I don't know what. But in context... Paul has been talking about how God in his wisdom took, the, took the, the Jewish nation who had been his chosen people, his sole vehicle to reveal himself, which they failed to do. And so now he was taking believing Jews and he was taking believing Gentiles and he was bringing them together into one body under Christ's rulership. And, and he was saying, this is the most incredible demonstration of the wisdom of God. Because Jews and Gentiles simply did not get along. Because um, uh, Jews uh, uh, treated Gentiles as a pagan heathen. And of course Gentiles treated Jews as, as um, temple, uh, temples, uh, uh, what's the word, people who steal from temples. Uh, because Jews said that no temple was really a temple if it wasn't the temple in Jerusalem. So they could take, and, and Paul picks that up in 1 Corinthians anyway. All right. But, but, but these two groups, they could not come together. And so God in his wisdom under Christ brings them together. And then suddenly we find we have all kinds of different people who are, who are meeting together in one place. And they don't come as, oh, I'm actually a, a Jewish background. Oh, I'm actually a Gentile background. They are all Christians under the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said, this is the wisdom of God. Amen. 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 So, so when... In, in, when, when I hear people who claim to be Christians, who show racism, something in me thinks they have never understood this chapter of Ephesians. Oh. Now, racism is when it's not when we, we make an objective statement. I mean, we can make objective statements about Anglo-Australians, can't we? Yes. That, that really sound horrible. Yeah. Like Italians. obesity and all kinds of stuff. Oh. Um, we, we can make statements and someone might say, oh, that's a racist statement against uh, Anglos. Well, it's not. It's ob objectively true. But when we make a statement and we, and we pool a whole group into one and we make a general statement that we say is true of all of them and it's not, that's when we have to be careful. We've stepped over a line toward racism. For instance, if I start a statement with all... All right, all blacks are, and then you fill in the last part. <laughs> I picked a really difficult one. Um, if I make a blanket statement and it turns out to be a negative quality, it will invariably be a racist statement. Because I'm making a statement about all, about the group, I'm making them all, there are no exceptions, and I, I'm putting something onto that entire group that is not objectively true, and it's negative. And so that's when it becomes a racist statement. So, so when I look at, at, at what Christ has done, and I look at how he brings Jews and Gentiles and all kinds of people. He brings people together who have white skin, yellow skin, red skin, thick skin, brown skin, 
Did I get all that in anyone? Dick skin. <laughs> Dick skin. Dick skin. Pink? Did we say pink? Green. Thick. Thick. Thin. Thick. Thin. Anywhere in between. See, I, I'm just trying to say that the wisdom of God was to be revealed through the church. I remember reading about a very famous American evangelical church, a really famous church. Um, in fact, the, uh, the uh, father uh, has a program on, uh, I think it's still on free to air television in Australia, and, and the, the place is chock a block full. And his son has started this very revolutionary kind of church. And, he, and his son gets asked to preach all around the world. And, um, and, and, and he's really careful, he really honours his own father. But he talks about the fact that, that one day in his dad's church, and that's a mega American, absolute mega church, um, he, said, he said, one day this um, African-American family wandered in and didn't realise. And, <laughs> and they didn't realise what? Didn't realise they're the only one among yeah. thousands of people there that wow. Sunday who were not Anglo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, and the Sun's church is, is like an absolute kaleidoscope. He's got every colour of, of every kind. <laughs> Because he doesn't want what became normal in his father's church. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't want that. And, and, uh, and, and I must admit, as much as I enjoy hearing the father preaching and enjoy hearing the son preaching, there are some things we just get in some kind of, I don't know, traditional weird kind of model in our, in our head. Alright, so, so let's come to the, to the uh, next one, the third one. Uh, so I'm talking about the church being the instrument of, of, of God's kingdom. And the third one I'm saying is this, the church is God's instrument to display the values of Christ's kingdom. Um, if you're following the New Testament reading uh, on the back of the notice sheet, and they're the same if you're doing the, the long readings, medium readings, or short readings, the, old, the New Testament readings are all the same. So a couple of weeks back you were doing the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is all kingdom values. I'm reading this through. I used to read that through thinking impossible, 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 impossible. But I'm saying these are the values of the kingdom of God. These are Christ's values. And just as I flicked through last night, I just began to just uh, give some, some headings to this. Uh, Jesus talked about spiritual emptiness, meekness, spiritual hunger, mercy, purity, obedience, righteousness, right relationships, forgiveness, humility, genuine love, giving secretly, praying secretly, fasting secretly, right priorities, not worrying, not judging others, right attitudes toward God, sacrifice. These are all kingdom values. And these are going from the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount to the end. And I, I would have left out some. I'm just quickly trying to, to rush through. So we have to be careful if we ever turn around and put just a strong emphasis on, well, I don't really need to be Christ-like. I just have to have Christ in my life. And we've got to be careful that we, we go too far in another, another way. Now, I'm going to show you some uh, research that some of you, including me, found very difficult. Uh, I did. I found this extremely difficult. This was done at the beginning of this year. It was research in Australia where they went to people who were not, um, who were not in church life at all and people who didn't have a uh, religious background. They, they, they wanted to, to, to get hold of good, ordinary, pagan Australians, of which we have many. We have many. And they uh, asked them, what, what attracts you about Christians and what repels you about Christians. Now this is all in Australia and before you say, oh look, this is really biased, whatever, this is done by a Christian research company called McCrindles, which is a, 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 a biggest Australian research uh, group in, 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 our, in our nation. So this is what they, what they found and, and as I said, I, I, I had difficulty with this, I wish it was different. So up this, this top part, uh, we've got the, the, what would strongly attract people to religion and spirituality. In the very top one, um, so seeing people who live out a genuine faith. Uh, next one, not quite as strong, but still strong. Experiencing a personal trauma or life event. They, they've watched Christians go through that and come out the other side. Um, and then the next one, a tiny bit further down, stories or testimonies from people who've changed due to their faith. What do you notice about each of these three? Not a trick, trick question. 
They live it out. They, they, they're, they're people who are living the values of the, of the kingdom. You see that? Now, this is the one I have a little bit of difficulty with. But what repelled people in Australia? 19% of people said um, philosophical discussion and debating ideas. They really don't like uh, to get into conversations with Christians who are very uh, uh, debating oriented. Now the next one I, I do have some problem with too. But 26%, a full quarter of people, said they are turned off by Christians who just tell them miraculous stories. Now that's the one I do have some difficulty with because I think when you go through a hard time, that's when you need to know that Christ heals. And then the, the next one, a tiny bit more so, that um, unsaved people, untruth people, said they, uh, 27%, hearing from public figures and celebrities who are examples of that faith. Oh. So we like to tell, oh, this one's a Christian, that one's a Christian. I don't know how many times I've put up on, on Facebook, or I've thought about putting up on Facebook, everything from uh, Denzel Washington statements to, to uh, I don't know who. Um, who's the guy who did, that's um, uh, no, all right, I well, I know, Phil an actor who died many, many years back. Uh, I just saw his um, testimony recently, American actor. But, but I, I've always thought that's what unsafe people want to hear in Australia. But the research shows that that's something that for a good quarter of them, it turns them off. Now, as I said, I would that this was a little bit different. And, and, um, but, but I want you to see that those who live out the values of the kingdom seem to be those who have the greatest impact on unsafe people in Australia. All right? You still with me? Yeah. Right, so, so if I'm going to be governed by Christ, then his values, the values of his kingdom, the Sermon on the Mount values, have to become the values that I, that, I, that I live by. They have to become the values. All right, let me go to the last one. All right, so I'm not going down here. The other person at the back. Not going down. I just go to the Watch next the slide. Yeah. Now you can. All right. All right. That was. Oh, oh. Yeah. 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 All right. Further up. Further up. <laughs> further up. Further up. Let's. Um, I'm just seeing this going up and up and down here. That's why. <laughs> All right. Let's let's go to to slide.